I want to talk, uh, start with Dr. Uh, Kaisel, and I, I want to do that in terms of Russia because obviously Russia experienced a lot of the same sort of thing that we, the worst sorts of things that happened in Ukraine, but I want to focus a little bit about what happened uh, when the USSR ceased to exist and what's happened over the last uh, 25 years or so in terms of uh, the plight of, Russia, of Christians um, and, and ask the, the question of as, do we have here simply a return to sort of the, the pre-communist era of the ascendancy of the Orthodox and the others as second class or are there significant differences now from what you saw before the communists showed up on the scene? Okay, terrific. Thank you for the question and also for your, your very thoughtful presentation on, on Ukraine. When we think about uh, Russia and put Russia in the, in the context of many of the other countries that we've studied and thinking about persecution of Christians, Russia is, is distinctive for many reasons. Uh, number one, Russia is a, a largely Christian nation. Two-thirds of the population self-identify as Christian. The Russian Orthodox Church has played a formative role in state building. It's seen as not only a cultural symbol, but spiritual symbol, serving as a bridge between the state and society. Russian political elites from the Kremlin at the highest levels identify as Christian, talk about the protection of Christian values, that this is something very important domestically and also within their foreign policy. But the protection of Christian minorities within Russia, uh, this is where the, where the rub is, where the problem. And the Christian minorities, this is roughly 5% of the population. Catholics, Lutherans, Methodists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Church of Scientology, Seventh-day Adventists. These are the Christian minorities which are at risk. But certainly Putin's Russia is not Stalin's nor Khrushchev's or perhaps not even imperial Russia. I think there's reason to be optimistic potentially and, and reason for hope. And I say this simply because my research in Russia, many of the Christian minorities communities that I interviewed refused to talk about the language of persecution and repression. They, they said, our situation, we've lived through persecution. We understand what that is like. Things are much better now. In, instead, they, they were much more in favor of talking about informal discrimination, invisible discrimination, quiet forms of repression. And what they, the examples that came up, perhaps a, a church registration would be denied, maybe for a spelling mistake, or their electricity may come on and off during worship services, or they may be talked about in the media, denounced as a cult or a sect, as an outsider or a, a pseudo-Christian. It may be difficult for them to rent space uh, in a hotel or from a landlord. They may be evicted because they're not seen as the right types of Christians. And so in terms of the repression that many of these communities faced under communism and perhaps even the marginalization in, in the imperial period, they were very optimistic thinking that this is, certainly there are problems in Russia, and I, do, I don't want to, to, to forget about those, but this is, this is a, a, an opportunity to find pockets of hope, and, and that these communities, in many cases, are carving out uh, spaces for freedom that they didn't have necessarily in the past. Good. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Collins, I have a question for you about uh, what happens, what's happened in uh, Central Asia, five republics in particular, although if you want to say something about Azerbaijan as well, that's fine, but we may not have too much time for that. But here's what I noticed. When I was, uh, I, when I first went to uh, Russia during the communist era and was working my doctoral dissertation, they kept me at the airport for five uh, hours because they found that the Russian Jew I was writing about had mentioned the word God in some of the books I brought into the airport, and they, uh, they didn't like that. 10 or 12 years later, 1990-91, I'm back teaching at Moscow State Un University, teaching a seminar on church-state relations and another seminar on G.K. Chesterton. Clearly something had happened. Something had happened. And in fact, while we were there, the hammer and sickle uh, came down uh, from the Kremlin. Now, here's my question for you. We had the feeling that the word of the demise of the Soviet Union had not made its way to Central Asia. 
that the rulers there of the republics uh, didn't really act very differently. And so my question is this. What has been the, the change, if any, since then? I mean, some of these countries are mainly Muslim. There's a lot of Russian Orthodox in Uzbekistan, but most of these are Muslim areas. Are the new governments now, um, do they want to consider themselves Islamic or not? And what's the uh, situation for Christian, and which way is the situation going? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, and uh, let me say thank you to the conference organizers again for um, putting together this, this marvelous and very important um, this, uh, event. And thank you particularly to um, Bishop Gudziak for that um, marvelous presentation and um, for putting the Soviet uh, history, um, give, giving us that context for thinking about what's going on today. Because unfortunately in Central Asia and Azerbaijan, we're still seeing much of that um, historical legacy continue um, to a far, far greater extent. I fear than um, than what has happened in, in Ukraine or in Eastern Europe or in Russia, or in some of the other more Western republics of the former Soviet Union. In the Central Asian states and Azerbaijan, and I'll speak broadly, there are some variations, but uh, um, in terms of their s uh, social composition as well as their um, political uh, regimes, but broadly, uh, it's a very authoritarian region, politically authoritarian region. And broadly, despite independence in 1991, uh, all five of the Central Asian Republics plus Azerbaijan uh, have reconstituted uh, authoritarian ex-communist states um, built on very strong ex-KGB systems. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is the one partial exception. How has that affected religion? Uh, initially, there was greater religious freedom, uh, in part because of the turmoil of transition in the early 1990s. Uh, but in the late 1980s, as you pointed out, that religious freedom had not really extended to Central Asia, either to Christians or to the predominant Muslim population uh, in the region. And despite a few years of more open borders, um, the uh, entree of thousands, really, of missionaries, particularly to Kazakhstan uh, and Kyrgyzstan, as well as to some of the other republics in that early period, there has been a significant retrenchment uh, from the late 1990s to the present, and that is continuing broadly across the region, and it is, is really quite worrying. Um, these are strongly secular authoritarian states. They're no longer communist. They no longer advocate the communist ideology. They no longer attempt to create Soviet men or atheist citizens. Beyond that, however, little else has changed. Um, so the first and most important threat to religious freedom uh, in these countries, for Christians and for Muslims, I should say, is um, from this secular state, which still has a significant animosity towards religion uh, of any form, and particularly any sort of independent religion. Um, the Russian Orthodox Church is a partial exception to that, and I can talk about that later if you want. But um, this manifests itself in many ways. Certainly we don't see the type of mass arrests on deportations to labor camps that we saw during the Soviet era. Um, we haven't had that type of sort of mass societal persecution. On the other hand, uh, registration requirements, as, as uh, uh, Carrie already talked about in Russia, are designed in Central Asia and implemented with a specific purpose of preventing people from practicing their faith. Uh, and they're quite active about doing that. Um, there are a handful of legal churches, but those legal churches operate under constant fear of their registration being revoked. They're rated, both legal and illegal churches are rated uh, often on regular bases. Pastors are arrested and put into prison. Um, there are no longer uh, uh, mass labor camps in the gulag system, of course, but uh, in Turkmenistan, labor camps do still exist and pastors uh, have been sent there. Uh, psychiatric uh, centers are used for the detention of, of pastors in a number of the Central Asian states, and that continues. Uh, injecting pastors with psychotropic drugs is a, is a practice that has been revived in recent years across the region. Uh, any sort of violation of the religious law is considered a criminal offense, so even ordinary people who, for example, bring their children to church, which is illegal in many of the Central Asian republics now, can be arrested uh, and fined uh, for bringing children to church. Uh, education is another critical, critical area. Um, 
education is completely controlled by the state, religious education by schools, um, uh, and even in the home is, is banned by the state. So that is probably one of the most serious areas that, that Christians feel um, state control and repression of their faith. Thanks. And uh, Dr. Young, I have a, a kind of a three-part question for you. You don't have the luxury of uh, uh, 20 minutes to do a summary of what happened between 1949 and, say, uh, 1980 or 1990. But I think the group would love to hear at least a, a, a quick summary, if you can give it, and if you have any numbers on what we think the, sky, the, the scale of, of violence uh, was against the Christians during those years. And the second question has to do with the question of the more, the more recent period. I mean, there have been a lot of people who were optimistic, guardedly optimistic over the last 10 or 15 years. They really felt like even though it was a communist regime, uh, there seemed to be some loosening, some improvement. And then we got start to get the word that the last couple of years something fairly dramatic is happening that doesn't, doesn't portend well for the future. Your thoughts on that? And the final point, and the point of the conference in many respects is not just to talk about the situation, but how it is Christians have responded. And I think the big mystery for many from outside China is they were shocked when word finally reached the West at just what the size of the Christian population was after the missionaries left in the middle of the century. And uh, as I mentioned in my introductory comments, there was, there was, it was a, almost a thriving of the faith. And so the, that's the third question is, how do you account for that? Why did the Chinese Christian church grow so dramatically? And because of that, are you reasonably optimistic even despite the downturn of the situation in the last couple of years? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, I hope I can do this within the time limit. Uh, about the first uh, 30 years, uh, the Chinese Communists uh, took power in mainland China in 1949. And uh, then in 1979, there uh, was a major change. But before the change, uh, China and Albania were the two countries that totally banned religion. Uh, so uh, more radical than the Soviet Union, as uh, just mentioned. Um, during that 30 years, according to some historians, there are half a million Christians died of unnatural death. That's uh, a tribute to many of the political uh, uh, catastrophes and the campaigns. Um, then since 1979, uh, as China uh, opened up to the West and trying to develop economy, uh, overall, uh, the situation really uh, uh, has uh, dramatically improved. There have been greater freedoms and greater social space created by the economic development, so that uh, now uh, uh, all kinds of religions are thriving. Uh, this does not mean there's no more uh, repression. That continues. There are still uh, persecutions, uh, but as a uh, different kind and different skill. Uh, yesterday, someone says, uh, you know, certain level of perse persecution helps Christian growth. And uh, China is the case. Uh, when there's a continuous uh, persecution and repression, uh, restrictions on Christians, and uh, uh, Christian churches, but that is uh, almost like uh, exactly the level that needed for the healthy growth. Uh, of Christianity in China. So, um, uh, talking about uh, the number of growth, the numbers, uh, when the communists took power uh, in 1949, there were about 3 million Catholics and 1 million Protestants. And after the policies changed in 1979, around that time, there were 3 million Catholics and 3 million Protestants. In other words, during the eradication period, Catholics maintained their number, even though when there was no church open. And during that time, Protestants uh, increased three times. Since then, uh, the growth of Protestants has uh, accelerated. Uh, according to the Pew Research Center's report of uh, global uh, Christianity, 
uh, in 2010, there were uh, 57 million Protestants and 9 million Catholics. Uh, the growth rate, uh, annual growth, average growth rate since 1980 uh, for the Protestants is about 10% a year. Um, or could, we could, uh, if count from 1950, it would be 7%. So if we have maintained this uh, 7 to 10% annual growth uh, of Protestants, so by 2030, there could be more Protestants in China than um, uh, all Christians in the U.S. Um, and that will be going to, uh, going to be about 15 to 30 percent of the Chinese population. Right now, it's only between 5 to 10 percent of the population are Christian. So in recent years, uh, uh, in the last two years, there have been some campaigns, uh, political campaigns, to subdue the Christian growth. Uh, the Christian churches in China, uh, you know, as uh, most of you know, is divided into the Catholics divided in, uh, in the above-ground churches and underground churches. And for the Protestants, there are so-called uh, three-self patriotic churches, and there are house churches. Uh, the patriotic churches are the government approved. The above ground churches are ab uh, government approved churches. They are growing. And the underground churches and the house churches are not legal, but they have been growing as well. Actually, uh, among the Protestants, uh, the urban house churches have been growing uh, rapidly, and, and they have become public. These are not uh, really uh, just uh, people meeting at uh, homes. Uh, there have been large congregations of several hundred people or even more than a thousand people congregate together. They insist that they belong to the house church movement because the house church uh, was, uh, was, had, had the history of resistance to the uh, government uh, suppression. And uh, uh, these uh, large congregations of house churches now is uh, really blossoming uh, in all the major cities uh, in China. So uh, given this uh, recent growth, uh, looking back at what happened in the 1950s, 1960s, the Christian response, I would say there are three types. You know, those who uh, cooperated closely with the Communist Party state. Uh, those joined the uh, Patriotic Association enthusiastically because they, many of them perceived that the Communists were doing some God-given missions, uh, uh, you know, striving for equality, for social justice. Uh, those collaborators. Uh, but those are few, only among the top leaders of the Patriotic uh, movement. Then the majority, uh, a large number of them are really uh, accommodators. This is okay, we have no choice but working under the, uh, under the communist rule. Uh, but uh, they try the hard, hardest to protect their faith uh, while trying to uh, circumvent uh, restrictions. Then there were a few leaders who are strong uh, resistors resisted the government pressure for them to join the patriotic movement. Those people were put in jail. Many of them were jailed for 20 years, for 30 years, and after they were released, uh, they were exiled to uh, outside China. This, even though during those 20 years when they were in prison, they didn't do much. But now thinking back, the current urban house churches really inherited their spirit of resistance. They refused to join the patriotic associations. They are thriving. So these different strategies may have short-term uh, consequences and long-term consequences. Uh, this resistance movement, the long-term consequence looks like quite, um, uh, quite significant. Good, thank you very much. I'm so tempted to uh, ask another uh, couple of lines of questions in, in light of uh, 
the things that have been said, but I'm going to try to be faithful to what I promised. And, but if you hesitate at all, I'm going to ask my questions. So uh, we do have mics here at the front. We have about 20 minutes left. And if anybody would like to ask some questions, please feel free to, uh, to come up. Okay, I'm going to ask, go, come on up. <laughs> you better quick. I, I'm really excited about my question, so uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, can anyone address uh, Jewish populations in Russia and if they are protected? Um, and, and are they thriving or reducing? Mm -hmm. That's on me. I will, I will try my best. Uh, the Jewish populations also are, represent a, a very small minority within Russia, but they are also considered a traditional religion. Uh, so Orthodox Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, and Judaism have this status of traditional religion. It doesn't give them um, you know, subsidies from the state, but gives them a special, a special sign, um, a protection, legitimacy that Christian minorities don't. Uh, so. Christian minorities are seen as outsiders, foreigners, where this traditional religious status uh, uh, is more welcoming or more accommodating of, of Jewish communities. But my general sense is it's, it's a very, very small percentage of the population. It's not growing, uh, growing terribly. There was a, a lot of uh, outflow of uh, Jewish immigrants during the 80s. Uh, a lot more than came out from the larger Christian communities. The Soviets were more willing to let the Jews go. In fact, they, they would sometimes say, we don't really consider them Russians. We consider the Christians Russians, the evangelicals Russians, but uh, so they would, let, they would let more Jews go. So it's a small, much smaller group than it, than it used to be many decades ago. And, and just to add, the, the 2002 Russian census uh, estimated 50, around 50,000 Jews mm -hmm. living within Russia. So again, it's a very small, all over um, uh, the Russian Federation. Yeah. So it's 